we tend to think of uh, NASA having to do with um, astronauts and space travel and all that sort of thing. Um, but of course, NASA does a tremendous amount for science. NASA has given us an array, vast array of telescopes that has enabled us to uh, study the universe in many different wavelengths. And uh, our guest tonight, Dr. Ken Carpenter, has been with the Hubble Project since it's, uh, well, since when? Just before since, its beginning. Just before <laughs> its beginning. And is deeply involved in the next set of telescopes that um, NASA will be sending into space. And so he's going to tell us about what's coming next and when and what are we going to learn. Okay. Uh, glad to be here tonight. Thank you guys for staying through our marathon. <laughs> So I'm going to, I'm, I'm just, by the way, doing NASA missions tonight. There are other missions that are going up from Europe and, and, and maybe from the Soviet Union, but in the time we have of Soviet we'll, Union, Russia. Yeah, <laughs> Russia, <laughs> yes. How old are you? You can tell how old yeah. I really am, yes. <laughs> So uh, today I'll, I'll tell you about some missions that are real in the sense that they've actually been given a go-ahead and funding to pursue. Uh, those are ones basically on the, the left hand of the screen as you're looking at it. And if we go through a little detail on that, I'll throw at you some more visionary ideas that are just concepts at this point, but I think you know, we'll fly something like those and they're kind of exciting. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about them as we uh, go along. So here's the plan for the next couple of decades and, and actually beyond. These are showing the astrophysics and exoplanet missions that are in the timeline right now. On the lower left, Hubble, Spitzer, and Kepler uh, are already obviously in space and operating, and you've probably seen wonderful data <laughs> coming down from all three of them. Uh, the next mission uh, in line is a small mission, what we call an Explorer-class mission similar to Kepler, uh, and also similar in the sense that it's going to be looking for exoplanets, trying to do a more complete census of exoplanets. Kepler has given us a wonderful start on it, um, but it's looked in one direction on the sky. TESS is going to do an all-sky survey, but not go as deep out in space, and we'll say more about that in a minute. That's supposed to launch uh, in the summer of 2017. And then uh, following that is gonna be the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, which is going to launch in the fall of 2018. It's a, a much larger telescope uh, than Hubble. It's the next big, uh, large strategic mission from NASA. And that will be followed by WFIRST, which is a wide field infrared survey telescope. There's some exciting news to tell you about that uh, in a moment. And then maybe beyond that, we start looking for a much larger version of Hubble. Uh, JWST and WFIRST are successors to Hubble, but they're not really new versions of Hubble. They don't work in the same color of light, and they're not really doing the same kind of science. Later on, we're going to launch um, something like Hubble, but with much larger mirror. Its main goal is going to be searching for life uh, beyond our solar system. So we call it a life-finding space telescope. That may be sometime out uh, in the 2030s or so, because we expect WFIRST to be mid-2020s. It'll take, probably take another five or ten years to get uh, the next large telescope in space. And then beyond that, out in the 2040s and 2050s, I think we're going to have to count on some of you youngins in the audience here to bring this to fruition. <laughs> we're going to be uh, entering the era of space interferometers. And it's been interesting to hear all the talk about interferometers tonight, because normally when I'm talking about interferometers, it requires a whole uh, background uh, set, which I think I can now skip because we, we, we've <laughs> talked about that. But it's the natural way, the only way we're going to get really high resolution observations of the sky. Uh, here are a couple of concepts that we've already studied, and I'll uh, amplify on two of them at the very end of the talk. Okay, so the first of the new missions, TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's going to be looking for planets around other stars by looking uh, at stars all over the sky, and we're looking for the stars to dim as the planets transit between us and the star. So the starlight's going to dim by a little bit every time a planet goes in front of us. Um, the idea of TESS is to more broadly survey for a wider range of planets than Kepler has been able to show us, all the way from small rocky planets and Earth-like planets up to subgiants like Neptune to the true giant gas uh, planets like Jupiter. This shows uh, a little sketch here of what Kepler had done, looking up from the sun in a narrow cone of light, so only in one direction on the sky, but looking very deeply out to about 3,000 light years. So we surveyed for transiting planets anywhere in that cone, but didn't see, didn't observe anything else around the entire sky. That allowed us to get a large amount of sensitivity to see uh, faint transits 
but we would like to see what's happening in other directions on the sky, and more importantly, we'd like to find some planetary systems that are closer to us. The biggest problem we've had with Kepler, which was a huge success because it's really increased our knowledge and the number of planetary systems we know about, but most of them are so far away that it's hard to follow up with other ground-based or space-based assets. Things are just too faint or too close together. So the idea behind TEST is to look much closer in. So around the entire sky and inside this circle, which is about 200 light years in diameter instead of uh, 3,000 light years out. So we look over the whole sky, but keep it very close in. And then when we find candidates, we'll be able to t turn other telescopes, Hubble, Webb, some of the ground-based telescopes onto it and find out much more information about what's really there. So it's very exciting. We expect tests to find something on the order of 500 small planets. And by small, I mean Earth or super Earth size. So you're talking about one Earth mass up to maybe several Earth masses. Uh, more than 1,100 uh, planets the size of Neptune or a bit smaller, and even 65 or more gas giants like our own Jupiter system. So it's going to be a very rich amount of data and a rich amount uh, of targets for other facilities to look at. Yes. Is there a limit as to how, how big a planet can be? Is, are, are the planets around our solar system as big as we can actually measure? Well, the only thing that stops you is eventually if you put too much mass into a sphere, it'll get so much pressure and such a high temperature at the center that it'll turn on and become a star. So there's a smooth sort of <laughs> transition there at some point. And a lot of people spend their careers looking at the very light end of stars, trying to find where do stars really start. And it's a kind of a, a fuzzy uh, number to, to put in terms of the mass. But they can certainly get larger than Jupiter, and we've, we've even seen uh, ones larger than Jupiter uh, with Kepler. Okay, so after tests, we get back into the era of big telescopes like Hubble, and here uh, are the next two coming up. On the left, the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, which will allow us to look further out in space, further back in time, at higher resolution, and look at fainter objects uh, than Hubble's been doing. And on the right, you see W first. Uh, the Wide Field uh, Infrared Survey Telescope. That is going to allow us to look at a broader area of the sky at one time and to survey a much larger fraction of the universe instead of just zeroing in on individual targets uh, like Webb will do. But they're both going to work in the infrared, colors of light that's redder than what the eye sees, in some case redder than even gets through the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, to kind of put all of this in context, we're going to be talking here about Hubble, Webb, and W first. Let's go really back. The first telescope was really the human eye. It's what was used to first discover what's out there in the sky. We discovered planets and stars, um, with it even ex some external galaxies are visible, like the Andromeda galaxy that we talked about earlier. That's all with basically a, a telescope lens that's only a, a couple of centimeters across. So let's compare this to the mirror on Hubble, <laughs> which is today's telescope. And you see it's a very tiny fraction of the light gathering power uh, and the re resolving power of Hubble. But with that huge increase uh, in mirror size going to Hubble, we've seen amazing wonders. In the upper left, you see a, a movie showing uh, observations take of the Jupiter system, not only showing the bands and cloud structure in Jupiter itself, but planets revolving around Jupiter and even the shadows of the moons uh, moving on the surface of the planet. So you see there in the center is the shadow of Europa um, and Europa much further behind it. Uh, in the center of the picture here is a star cluster. Uh, down here, uh, a dying star that's sho shoved off layers of material into interstellar space, layers that include a lot of heavy elements like the Earth and we are made out of, which is why... Shops. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Uh, external galaxies like our own Milky Way, these spiral galaxies with this gorgeous structure out here. That is observation, actually several observations of a single supernova. Very distant supernova has gone off, exploded. The light has gone through this mass of material in the front here and has actually created four different lensed images of it. And in the initial observations of that, it was predicted by looking at the geometry of everything that we would see additional images appear later in time. And again, as another wonderful confirmation of theory and observa by observation, indeed those later images did show up in the locations predicted at the time uh, predicted. It's been a, a wonderful uh, thing to see. Um, 
actually come together like that. It's the first time that we've ever predicted in advance the appearance of a supernova image, although, you know, cheated because we saw the early images, but. Um, and the lower image there on the right is uh, what's known as the Hubble Deep Field. That is the deepest view into the universe, the one that goes furthest back in time that we've acquired to date. Um, it's basically, a image was acquired by finding the blankest spot in the sky that we could find and then staring at it for 11 days and just gathering photons bit by bit. And we didn't really know what we'd get. The idea was to find a spot with nothing in the foreground so that you could easily, it wouldn't be confusing when you saw something in the image. And by the time we were done, we saw something like 10,000 galaxies in that one image in a tiny part of the sky. And I, I mean galaxies, not stars. So each of those blips you see with maybe four exceptions is a galaxy of 100 billion stars or more. Just a tremendously rich early universe. And as a matter of fact, if you assume the galaxy density is the same in all directions on the sky, that implies that there are more stars in the universe than all the grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. Just some incredibly huge number. Okay, going from today's telescope, Hubble, comparing it to the James Webb Space Telescope, we see you make another great jump here. It has been a little difficult going to the larger mirror. Hubble's 2.4 meters in diameter. Webb is 6.5 meters in diameter. So we went to a segmented design. You have a bunch of individual mirrors here that actually fit together and make the larger telescope. And actually, prior to launch, these three mirrors here and the three on the other side are actually going to be folded up inside the cowling because the entire uh, mirror won't fit inside the, the launch vehicle. So it's one of the things that's going to have to unfold after launch. Um, <laughs> that's not the frightening part. No, the frightening part not. is the sunshade yeah. down here, which is five layers of a very thin mylar foil the size of a tennis court. So there are five layers of really thin material that are all rolled up at the start. So they first of all have to roll out sideways, and then they have to be unpacked vertically to separate the five layers. And you look at this and you say, how in the world are you going to make this happen? Because this is going to be way out a million and a half kilometers, a million miles uh, away from Earth. So you're not going to service it like Hubble if something doesn't work. Um, so you know we worry about it, but the contractor that's building this also builds things for the dark side. And they say, don't worry, we build things that deploy all the time. It'll be fine. <laughs> so we're taking their word for it at the moment. <laughs> And it does make you wonder, what else is out there that we don't know about? <laughs> um, the Webb Telescope was the top priority from the 2000, uh, what's called the Astrophysics Decadal Survey. Once every 10 years, the astronomical community gets together and says, okay, let's figure out what the most important science is for the next 10 years and what facilities we need to build it. Um, and in, 20, in the year 2000, it was decided that Webb was the most important thing to build. As you can tell, if you do a little simple math here, recommended in 2000, it's well past 2010. We didn't get to Webb in the last decade because it turned out to be harder and more expensive uh, than we thought it would be. But it is going to launch in uh, 2018, um, and it looks like we're on track for that. There haven't been any date slips or funding overruns in years now, so I think we're in good shape. It'll be the largest, obviously, most powerful telescope ever built when it goes up something like 10 new technologies used uh, in doing this, not the least of which is the, uh, the sun shades and the actuated mirrors, but exquisite sensitivity and image uh, clarity. Okay, so with Hubble and with Webb, they're basically telescopes that allow you to zero in, really look at a small area of the sky in detail. But imagine what happens if you went through life only having that telephoto view, um, like you see here. Say you were looking at a waterfall or a little piece of a waterfall, like is shown down here, you might not really understand what you're seeing, whereas if you had the broader view, you might discover you're looking at the Canadian Falls at, uh, at Niagara. So what we needed for the next mission after Webb is something that would, able, would, would give us that, that broader view. And that's actually the W first mission that we've talked about before. Now is a particularly exciting time to be talking about W first to you because we have been studying yeah. ways of doing this mission for six or seven years. Um, 
and you know, going through different designs over and over, trying to find ways to optimize it, but never getting a go-ahead from NASA headquarters or from Congress to spend the money to actually start doing the mission. And just two weeks ago, so this is breaking news, we got what's called a new start, where they're basically saying, go ahead into the detailed design phase and proceed to build us this mission to, to do what you uh, promised. So it's a very exciting time. We hope to launch sometime in the mid-2020s. Um, so it's a nice uh, even cadence if Webb goes up in 2018, W first in the middle of uh, the next decade, and then um, something in the early 2030s. What orbit? This is, uh, like Webb, is going to go uh, into L2, which is about a, a million miles uh, beyond the moon uh, in the direction away from the sun, uh, from the Earth. Uh, the early versions of W first were actually in uh, Earth orbit. Uh, above low Earth orbit and what we call uh, but below geo, kind of in a medium uh, Earth orbit. But uh, after uh, extended study, it was decided we could do our job better uh, out at L2, even though that puts it out of the reach of, of servicing. It's just another thing we have to get right. Another thing that was really interesting with w First, it started out as a one and a half meter telescope to save money. And then we got a knock on a door at one point from the National Reconnaissance Office saying, oh, you know, we just we finished our last generation of spy telescopes and we're going on to something better. We got a couple of optical telescopes assembly, a couple of Hubble size optics left over. You want them? I think we're going to throw them out otherwise. <laughs> so, what? Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> so they, uh, they had two of these and they were designed for a broader field of view, which just fit in perfectly with what we were trying to do with, with W first. Um, so we, we dot that. They didn't give us the entire telescope. It's just basically the primary mirror and the secondary and the structure that holds the optics. Uh, so it did cost us a little bit more, but we're getting a much larger telescope than originally planned. So I think it's a win-win for, for everybody. How big is it? It's a, a 2.4 meter telescope, just the size of Hubble. Uh, it's it's uh, the same in diameter. It's actually not as long. Uh, Hubble is the size of a school bus. Uh, w first is a little more compact because of the design to get the wide field of view on the sky. Uh, so it has Hubble's power and resolution, but it has about a hundred times the field of view, instantaneous field of view, and you'll see what that means in a minute. Actually, right here, you see a single exposure uh, size from a Hubble camera on the sky to the same scale. This is what W first will get. It actually uses 18 separate detectors because the area is so broad, we can't build a single detector that covers that area. But uh, it's a huge increase in, in what we'll be able to see in a, a single exposure. Uh, it's designed to study dark energy, look for exoplanets, and do wide field surveys in the infrared. Dark energy is important because it's been discovered relatively recently that the expansion of the universe is not currently slowing down like everybody expected. Uh, you know, the universe has been expanding, had been expanding, and slowing down for about the first five or six billion years of its life. But if you look at later years, closer to our own times, we discover that the universe is, instead of slowing down in its expansion, is speeding up. It's like if you took a ball and you threw it in the air, instead of it slowing down and coming back to you, it went up and started going faster. It's like, what? You know, <laughs> it it, it kind of like just blew all our minds, and we don't really know what's causing it. So we call it dark energy, because it's a nice cool name, and it's dark because we don't know what it is. Yeah. Just like dark matter, it's the same sort of thing. Um, so W first is hoping to get more observational information to constrain the theories and maybe figure out exactly what it is. It's something which pushes things apart at very large distances. When the universe has expanded sufficiently, it overcame the force of gravity and is starting to accelerate the expansion. That's one of the biggest puzzles in modern astronomy, so I'm very excited to actually be working uh, on the telescope that might help us figure out what it is. Or, you know, maybe not, because it's going to be a thorny problem. <laughs> we'll, we'll understand better what's happening. Uh, we're also going to do a technology demonstration of a coronagraph, which is designed to look at a star, blank out the light of the star so we can see planets nearby, uh, basically by removing the glare of the star um, as a uh, preparation for later missions. So, uh, in summary, here, uh, Hubble is the foundation of lots of the science that we're going to be looking at. We're going to use Webb's 100 times more power and W first 100 times wider view to push the frontiers of astrophysics uh, and, and learn even more about the universe. This shows the big questions that are out there on the left-hand side. 
questions we expect Webb to address in particular. Uh, perhaps the most important, when did the first stars and galaxies form? When the universe first expanded, when you first had the Big Bang, there weren't actually any individual stars or galaxies, nothing to shine, so you can't see anything. At some point, the first stars and galaxies turned on, and that's Webb's job is to go back and find out exactly when, how many millions of years after the Big Bang did the first stars and galaxies form, and then we want to follow their uh, evolution forward in time until you get to the era that Hubble has been looking at already. There are certain distances beyond which we haven't been able to, to see with Hubble, and even in cases where we've looked very far with Hubble, we've only done that in one or two directions on the sky. Webb will allow us to look in all directions very close uh, to the, uh, the, the first stars and galaxies. So can I ask, does that mean that the Webb will be used for a lot of uh, deep field imagery? Yes. Uh, oh, cool. And uh, well, almost everything it does will be looking deep, except when it's looking at nearby planets or whatever. But I'm sure there will also be specific deep fields where you just stare at an area for a long period of time. Uh, we'll also look at planetary atmospheres, at the light coming through it for background stars, and studying how stars and planets form and how they evolve with time. On the right side, you see a summary of what W first is going to do. Expand the search for exoplanets to broader areas. Kepler only looked at the inner solar systems. W first will be able to look at outer uh, parts of solar systems. Uh, on the bottom here in this changing movie, this is the coronagraph or a simulation. When the starlight's there, you can't see anything behind it. When you suppress the starlight, you see all the planets hiding underneath the glare of the light. We want to show that that actually works in space, and then we will build a dedicated mission uh, to, to do that. And the bottom right there is just showing the, the story about mm -hmm. the expansion of the universe that I already talked about and trying to understand why it's accelerating. Is there any expectation that a coronagraph wouldn't work? Was it LCD in front of the... It's, it's a tough job because uh, you have to suppress about 10 to the minus 9 of the original light. So zero followed, you know, zero point zero 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 out to nine decimal points. So you have to get rid of that much of the light to actually get to the, the mm. background stars. So it's, it's tough. We think we can get there, but you know, you just have to show it. This shows a, a planet transiting uh, a bright star and the fact that if you look at the light going through the atmosphere of this planet from the star and you look at where it dips, at spots like this you can look for signatures of things like water and methane that are either necessary for life or uh, signatures uh, of life. Why do we want to go into infrared so much? Because both of these missions we're talking about are the infrared. As the universe expands and light's emitted from a galaxy, as space expands, the light waves get stretched out and they turn from blue to red. So if you're looking at very distant parts of the universe, you need to look in the red uh, to see the brightest amounts of light coming out from those objects. This is the Hubble Deep Field we talked about earlier. Remember the single image that showed us 10,000 galaxies? Let's compare to what we'll see now with W first. That is what we expect W first deep field to look. Each image with W first, each deep field image, will contain a million galaxies in a single image. It's going to be absolutely incredible, and we'll, we'll certainly get a handle on how much variation there is around the sky, but the data from this is going to keep astronomers happy for <laughs> literally years afterwards. Mm -hmm. How far after the Big Bang do we expect to be able to see? The first stars and galaxies probably turn on somewhere around 200 million years after the Big Bang, but we don't know that, which is why we're flying Webb in particular. Somewhere between 200 and 400 million years, I would guess. Just a, a little promo for what's in the depths of space right behind us here. You've got a, a it's not necessarily a very deep field, but you've got a million galaxies in one image. Something to look at on the way out. Another reason for looking in the infrared uh, is that you see things differently at different colors. This is an optical image from Hubble showing a star forming region, lots of gas and dust. If you go into the infrared, you can actually see into uh, the nebula and actually through in some spots. So you get to see a lot more structure and detail. And actually the ideal thing is to have a broad range of, range of colors so you can see all the different layers of, of the material. But again, yet another reason for opening new infrared windows into space. We think by using JWST and W first at the same time, we're going to be able to disentangle the effects of cloud cover and weather variations on the planet um, because W first in the near infrared is sensitive to one of those, Web in the mid infrared further out to the red. 
uh, as sensitive to the other, and if you have both at the same time, you ought to be able to tell which is which. This is an image of M31 taken in ultraviolet light, which is look, why it looks a little bit different from what we saw earlier. Um, to show you what it looks like more in its place on the sky, that's an image compared to a very uh, deep and long exposure uh, of our nighttime sky. The band across it is our own Milky Way galaxy, uh, which is similar in shape to, and to Andromeda, except we're buried in the middle of it, so it looks like this kind of chaotic cloud from our perspective. Hubble went and did what's called the Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury Program, FAT for short because we like cute names. Um, so here's a fly-in to that data. Basically we imaged about a third of the Andromeda galaxy and notice now as you're zooming in, no matter, as you continue to go in further and further, you just find more and more detail. At, and at the end, you get down to a point where you're seeing individual stars in this galaxy that's more than two million light years away. It's an absolutely incredible treasure trove of data. You see the different colors, red or older stars, less massive, blue tend to be uh, younger stars uh, and, and more massive. Um, and again, a, a treasure trove of, of data for people to analyze. But it took a huge amount of time to actually get that data. And this shows you what Hubble had to do. It basically made a mosaic of a very large number of images that had to be pieced together. And you'll see here, we painted the galaxy in a total of 432 individual exposures. W first will get the same data in two exposures. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of taking something like 500 hours of exposure time and in something like a couple of hours, we'll get the same depth. That means we can not only cover the rest of Andromeda, we can do it for a lot of other nearby galaxies and do a lot of comparisons of the stellar content of those galaxies and the structures of the galaxies as you go along. A huge leap forward. Oh, imagine being a grad student today. Uh -huh. You know, there's so much to do. It's so exciting. <laughs> W first will launch in the mid 2020s, probably 2024, 2025. There isn't actually a launch date to it yet, but something like that. I'm going to see if I can hang in my career long enough to get to launch, but I'm going to get it started at least. How long will it take to do the entire sky? Well, we want to actually image the hot, the entire sky, even with this kind of, of, of breath. It would still take a very, very long time. So we'll try to do some uh, careful choices of, of where we know there are interesting things to do. And there's no lack of it. We're already at, I'm actually out here this week because we had a, a meeting in Pasadena of astronomers to come in and tell us what they would do if they were given some time on this telescope. Part of the telescope time, a large fraction of it, is surveys that are predefined, but we're reserving about a quarter of the time for a competition. So you'll ask for proposals worldwide saying, tell us what you'll do. And if you have the best idea in the universe, we'll give you a chance to get some data with it. <laughs> uh, question, what means of propulsion are you using to repoint the telescopes? Hubble uses uh, actually uh, spinning wheels. Uh, um, doesn't actually have any propellant on it at all. Uh, uses electricity to spin up and drive down the wheels, so we use solar panels to get the electricity. Uh, Webb will have propellant on it, and has. Uh, it's designed for a minimum of five-year lifetime. We hope if we get a good orbit injection, into L2 that will be able, have enough fuel left to be able to control the orbit for about uh, another five years with a, a 10 year mission life. Um, w first, um, I don't know that we've decided yet whether there'll be propellant on it or not. I suspect since it's at L2 we'll have to because you need to uh, have a way out there to unload the momentum wheels. Um, after you build up too much, you get them spinning too fast, it's a bad thing, so you have to push against it to unload them. Okay, um, beyond JW and W first, uh, we get to the, the realm where we don't have any firm missions. We have a lot of ideas. I'll just tell you some of the more exciting ones. On the left there uh, is a mission to expand NASA's search for life in the universe. And on the right, a concept for examining the universe in even higher definition than we've seen so far. Uh, the first one is called Louvoir for Large UV Optical Infrared. Basically very similar in wavelength and color coverage to Hubble. Bluer, goes from bluer than the eye can see through the optical that the eye does see out into the infrared that's redder than what the eye sees. Uh, the design is very similar to JWST, uh, has a large sunshade down here and then a segmented mirror. But instead of being six and a half meters in diameter, we would probably be talking 10 to 20 meters to do the, the science that we're talking about. 
science in particular will require high resolution sensitivity. If that's a, what Hubble would see of a particular galaxy, a 15 meter telescope would improve the resolution by that much. Mm. Tremendous uh, advance. And we think we're going to need something like that to do what we really want to do, which is search for signs of life. We're not actually going to get images like this. That's <laughs> artist's conception of what well, crazy life might be out there. Uh, but we will get spectra like you see in the lower right. And there, again, the idea is to look at light intensity versus color, looking for dips that indicate oxygen, ozone, water vapor, uh, vegetation jump, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, all the things that are signatures of life. Um, with this larger telescope, we'll have enough, enough sensitivity to be able to look at the light coming from the planet directly and to see uh, whether those signatures are there or not. And someday, beyond that, probably talking out in the 2040s or 2050s, we will have great arrays to probe the universe in amazing detail. I'll just mention two of them here. Uh, the one on the left, Stellar Imager, I just have to talk about because I actually executed a study on that uh, a number of years ago. The idea here was to build a telescope large enough to actually image the surfaces of stars beyond the sun and actually see things like the sunspot patterns that you see on the, the sun that move around and change in 11 year periods. If we can find signatures of that kind of magnetic activity, we know more about the stars, more about our own sun, but we'll also know how the magnetic activity impacts the planets around it and whether life would be viable there or not. To do this, we have to fly, in this concept, 30 different spacecraft in formation, like a flight of blue angels doing precision formation flying. They each carry something like a meter-sized mirror. They all have to point at the same object on the sky at the same time and direct the light back to a beam combiner here, which puts it all together and makes the image. So you have 30 different spacecraft, 31 if you include the beam combiner. They all have to fly with very high precision, but and the diameter of this sparse array here is anywhere from about 500 meters up to more than a kilometer. So it's a huge telescope um, with a lot of precision flying, but if it works, then you get these uh, amazing images of the surfaces of other stars, but also at the center of active galactic nuclei, binary stars that are exchanging mass. You might actually be able to see the mass flowing from one star to another, all sorts of crazy and, and wonderful things. Um, and we hope to do that. Accretion dip dips around Accretion. black holes. Yes, exactly. Um, and if you want more information on that, there's a URL there uh, where you can find out about it. Uh, the ultimate goal of everything that we're doing now, though, I think uh, all of us want to do is to actually get to a point where we can image terrestrial-type planets, image other planets like the Earth. And to do that, uh, one concept that's been talked about is a terrestrial planet imager. And um, someone earlier asked about an interferometer of interferometers. That's exactly what TPI is. You see here, structurally connected individual interferometers with maybe five, four or five elements in it, and then a series of these five element interferometers scattered around space over a huge distance. That's what would be required to actually resolve continents and oceans on other Earth-like planets. Uh, that's where we're going. It may take us uh, a while, but um, there's nothing physically impossible or optically impossible in doing it. We just uh, have to do a lot, a lot of hard work. In the meantime, you see, have all these other missions that we've been talking about uh, to keep us intrigued and interested. And uh, I'll think I'll stop with that because going any further out is going to be tricky. <laughs> <laughs>
all of this sensitive imaging, you must be talking about a tremendous amount of data that is being collected. And in, aside from the observation challenges, are, do you, are there computer, are there data mining challenges that you guys have? Yeah, and actually a, a good chunk of, of one of the days this week was exactly about that problem. Uh, we're going to have some help in that there are some large data systems uh, happening on Earth right now. There's something called the Large Survey Synoptic Telescope, LSST, which is supposed to be built before uh, we actually start operating WFIRST, for instance. And so they're on the, the leading edge of it and trying to deal with all the, the, the hardest problems. So we're hoping to learn a lot from them. We may even, in the end, have some sort of system which co-reduces LSST data and uh, WFIRST uh, as part of the same system or something. It's, it's a challenge, but you know, fortunately computers get more and more powerful every day. The data storage is, is almost frightening in the, in the volume. Uh, hopefully things will, technology will, will keep up with us. We are constrained a little bit by how much we send down from L2 because it's so far away and they have limited uh, antenna capability. So at some point we will actually do some preliminary reductions in orbit on the telescope and send down compressed images or just uh, samples and not every single piece, uh, not every single photon that we see. I'm afraid, sadly, I must cut it off because it's 9.59 and you have to be out by 10. <laughs> so uh, I do want to say uh, two last things. One is that uh, the thing that I think really strikes me about this and, and, and I, I wanted to talk about it during the LIGO thing and that is that th what science can do for us People ask, what does LIGO, what are gravity waves going to do for us? Well, we don't know. That's one thing. But the technology to get there to detect them has left a trail of technologies that are helping us today. So basic science, some of this, well, what's all that far out stuff, takes us in directions where the technology to develop them become uh, applicable to solving everyday life problems. So there's a dream and there's a, a pra practical side too. Next month, uh, our guest is Dr. Michelle Fowler, who uh, is an astronomer but is now the Deputy director, uh, director of Communications for the entire space, the entire science division at NASA. And she, since we have a lot of astronomy here, she's going to really tell us more about uh, NASA's Earth Science Program. Oh my so god, we have, did you think that was a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Uh, so on that note, let me invite you back. Someone's going to ask you if I said that. Um, so, uh, let me invite you back next month, and uh, we'll try to keep the questions a little tighter, and I'll try not to go on so long. All of us won't. But thank you for coming, and uh, we appreciate your timely exit. Thank you.